Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lucy Bolivant. I'm one of the trustees for Temple Bar Trust. And since July 2020, I've curated the Trust's popular online series of talks. And you can see the wealth of talks, videos, and films that we've uh, created over the last two years on the Trust's website, templebartrust.org. Temple Bar Trust promotes architecture, urban and landscape design in the square mile and its environs to a wide public through a regular events program. And equally important is our active support for greater diversity in the architecture and built environment professions, which we address through our talk series and also our associated educational initiatives. It's going to be a wonderful moment for the Trust and its audiences when we finally return to live events at our home, Temple Bar on Paternoster Square next to St Paul's Cathedral in the City of London in September after some small uh, internal improvement works there. And we'll soon be announcing uh, our exciting event plans for Temple Bar on our website and on social media. And I'm happy to say that these will continue to include the live streaming of talks in order to ensure that they're fully accessible by all members of our audience. So Temple Bar, Architectural Gateway to the City, designed by Sir Christopher Wren and managed by the Trust, is also home to our associated worshipful company of chartered architects, of which I am a livery man, yes, indeed. Um, and when we are open in September, Temple Bar will serve as a wider base, giving people a greater understanding of how the city works holistically. So that includes acknowledging some of its di key diverse figures and a number of the occupiers of superb buildings, some of them architects. So at Temple Bar, we're creating a living gateway to understanding the city at a deeper level. The city in all its dimensions, its environment, its buildings, its inhabitants and people's lived experiences, its strengths, its challenges and many more. And uh, hoping that everyone who comes to visit or enjoys an event will learn and, uh, and engage and, and meet new people and meet their friends and colleagues along the way. So we're really looking forward to activating our space for in-person events, meetings, dining and entertainment, and to welcoming you there. So you'll also have the opportunity to book our venue for your own events as well, which is a very exciting prospect. So tonight I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Lauren Shevels. Hello, Lauren. Hi Lucy, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So um, just very briefly with the title of Architects Climate Action Network Collective Action, Lauren, who's an architect and an activist, is going to talk about the work of the Architects Climate Action Network, otherwise known as ACAN, which she co-founded in 2019. ACAN is an open network of individuals within the architecture and related built environment professions, and they are taking a decisive action to address the twin crises of climate and ecological breakdown. We're going to hear about the powerful reach ACAN has achieved in the UK and internationally, collaboratively and as a collective specific ACAN initiatives and what the next steps uh, Lauren and, and her colleagues anticipates being. So it began life as a group of architects discussing how they might launch a climate activist group uh, in 2019. And ACAN has since grown organically to include around 200, sorry, 300 active members in the UK and it's now established similar connections with other international groups, as well as a family of international uh, groups uh, following and, uh, propo pro and advancing the ACAN work. So at the heart of, of the activity is research, political campaigning and direct action um, to continue building a collective, like, uh, collective agency. So before, Lauren's presentation, here are a few biographical details. Lauren's an architect and activist campaigner, and she believes firmly in the role of the architect being a broad one, and it, that it involves giving back to the city and engaging 
with local communities. She takes an active role in championing community interest and designing well-considered and beautifully crafted spaces. She has over 10 years professional experience in architectural design, teaching and fabrication, both in London and in Copenhagen, including in London working for May Architects. So Lauren's key interests lie in research and collective action through architectural activism, whilst at the same time focusing on delivering quality architecture for positive social change. And since two, spring 2022, she's been working as place shaping officer at Westminster City Council and is a public practice associate. So we are really looking forward to your talk. Um, thanks very much, Lauren, and over to you. Thanks, Lucy. Um, that was a very nice introduction. I don't really need to introduce myself now. Um, <laughs> But yes, thank you again so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. As Lucy said, uh, my name is Lauren Shovels. I'm an architect and an activist, and most recently a place shaping officer at Westminster City Council, where I work alongside Lucy to plan and shape the urban realm of the city of Westminster. Alongside that, I'm also one of the ACAN UK steering group coordinators, and my role in that, I specifically look at movement culture, so tonight I'm going to introduce who we are and what ACAN is and why we decided to set up. Atmospheric CO2 has never been as high as it is now, approximately 418 parts per million. At current rates of greenhouse gas emissions, we are on track to exceed 450 parts per million, which puts us on track for 2.4 degrees of warming. We are heading into dangerous territory where we will breach many planetary limits and in turn trigger irreversible planetary tipping points. Across the board, we talk about global targets. The problem with talking about targets and setting goals is that they often become subsumed into daily language and start to mean less than they should. Targets set by the Paris Agreement are starting to look like positive goals rather than realising that if we, that it is at this point if we breached um, into critical tipping points and it will push us into irreversible climate catastrophe. This is what one degree of warming looked like back in 2020. So why this inertia? and why so little action. Following the seismic response to the 2018 IPCC report, a small group of us decided that not enough was being done from within the industry, and ultimately we wanted people to feel empowered to make change. Inspired by the youth climate movement and the publicity that XR's civil disobedience caused, we took to the streets and, gathered, and quickly gathered momentum realizing that individually our impact would be relatively low, but collectively we would be a force to be reckoned with. In November, 2019, we ran our first ever architects assembly where we crowdsource ideas and how to take action. This was also the genesis of our thematic groups, which now forms our wider network. ACAN is now a voluntary network of over 300 individuals from within architecture and the built environment professions. We take critical action in the face of the climate and ecological crises. ACAN empowers individuals to proactively seek change and facilitates collective, collective effort through a shared platform built on collaboration. ACAN is built around a set of values which brings people together and to help enable equal participation as much as possible. We use facilitation techniques and practice, and practice active listening. We try to use consensus decision-making where possible, considering how to engage different individuals effectively and to resolve issues with the solution agreed by all parties. ACAN is driven by three overarching aims. One, the rapid decarbonisation of our built environment, pushing for the ambitious regulation that we urgently need. Two, 
ecological regeneration, tackling the bigger crisis of ecological breakdown, recognizing we need to go beyond net zero to regenerative practice, and having an ultimate goal of net positive impact on biodiversity and the natural environment. And finally, three, cultural transformation, bringing agency back to the individual, encouraging a more collaborative environment, inspiring workplace activi activism and creating change with our everyday jobs. We run ACAN as an open network and allow anyone to join as long as they share our values and principles. One, we seek urgent radical change. Two, we need systemic change. Three, we need a new kind of professionalism. Four, our focus is action. Five, we seek radical honesty. Six, we believe in collective agency. Seven, we seek to be transparent. Eight, we value independence. Operating in this way allows us to work more collaboratively and in a decentralized way. This is a diagram of ACAN's current operational structure. We also incorporated into a BENCOM or a community benefits society. ACAN coordinators operate under these three core groups in the middle of the central diagram. We have a steering group which focuses on organizational strategy, um, movement culture and finances, etc. We also have a movement support group with people working on the practical operation, running events, social media, graphics, etc. And a thematic group, thematic group coordinators who lead, run and facilitate group meetings. These thematic groups of which we currently have nine form the main body of ACAN. ACAN is set up to run as democratically as possible. Each thematic group is autonomous, able to make their own decisions about how they conduct meetings and campaigns as long as they respect the guiding values and principles and their mandates respond specifically to one or more of our three aims. As I mentioned before, we practice a decentralized decision-making which allows further autonomy and reactive responses to current affairs. I'll just run over each of the nine thematic groups. Circular Economy is campaigning for an eighth RIBA stage to close the loop on circular construction. Education is campaigning for better architectural education and for heads of schools to declare climate emergency within their curriculums. Embodied Carbon is tackling the elephant in the room, Embodied Carbon. Existing Buildings look, is looking at cities as material banks and understanding the urgent need to retrofit our existing building stock even more important in the current cost of living crisis. Carbon literacy is improving the industry's understanding of the climate emergency through different narratives. Professional standards is working collectively with institutions like the Architects Registration Board, ARB, and the Royal Institute of British Architects, the RIBA, to better practice standards. Where the wild things aren't, is set up to tackle our second aim of ecological regeneration, an objective that is often missed or overlooked in the construction industry. Natural materials is encouraging low carbon building techniques. So these are the types of actions that we take within our nine thematic groups and the wider network. A large part of our strategy has been movement building, understanding the value in collective action, and so further gaining momentum and bringing people together and expertise into the group. We also practice political campaigning and lobbying in order to create truly systemic change. We need to address the standards and regulations that may no longer be appropriate. Protest movement and direct action has paved the way for major changes in the past. We also use social media, letter writing and protesting as a way to raise awareness and support for our causes. We understand the severity and urgency of the situation and the current methods advocating for sustainable practice may not be enough and they may be required forms of direct action, such as marching on parliament and protesting, as is our civil right. Sharing knowledge and supporting individuals and advocating for professional activism as well as activism outside work. This is what architectural activism looks like. But where does architecture stop and activism start?
As I mentioned, we have a number of different thematic groups working on various issues within the industry. Each of these groups operates autonomously and they have their own mandates and often their own theory of change. I will now present some past campaigns which have focused particularly on collective action across the built environment industries. Future building standards. As part of our work at ACAN, we collectively respond to government white papers and consultations. We use a huge amount of resource and pro professional expertise to meticulously answer and campaign for better environmental targets with gov within government policy. Back in, back in October 2019, the government ran a consultation on its proposed future home standard, which would feed into amendments to the building regulations part LNF. Concerned about some of the proposed policy changes, ACAN ran a short campaign to encourage the responses to the consultation. We recognised this as a huge opportunity to influence the building regulations and encourage built environment, environment professionals to respond to the building regulations, stating that this may be one of the greatest impacts you could have in your career. We wrote an open letter signed by over 700 industry professionals addressed to Robert Jenerick, the then State of Se the then Secretary of State for Housing Communities and Local Government. The letter stated our four main areas of concern. One, fabric energy efficiency, standard known as fees, should not be banned. Two, energy consumption reporting should be easily understandable. Three, ambitious local authorities should not be stripped of their powers to set energy efficiency standards. Four, the future, the future home standards needs to consider embodied carbon of buildings. Working with a robust technical response collated by Letty, the ACAN Embodied Carbon Group promoted a how-to guide, shared a draft response template and ran workshops. This work helped dramatically boost the number of responses to over 3,000. Letty then ran a more robust response mission to the second part of the consultation, future building standards, which ran from January 2001 to April 2001. More than a year now has passed since the future building standard consultation and the government has since published the consultation outcomes. Following the huge industry-wide response, the fabric first approach to energy efficiency standard was retained, ensuring that designers can contribute to focusing on reducing energy consumption by increasing the performance of the building fabric. Another key outcome from the consultation was to allow local authorities the freedom to continue to set their own energy efficiency standards, allowing them to be more ambitious than central government. Working collectively to share simple messages, these were then relayed back by thousands of professional consultation responses, a clear win for collaborative approach. Another campaign that we've, we've, won, we've run has been the Regulate Embodied Carbon campaign, another one from the Embodied Carbon thematic group. Embodied carbon emissions account for 11% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Embodied carbon emissions are the greenhouse gas emissions that come from building, maintaining and demolishing a building. This includes extraction of raw materials, manufacturing of products and materials, the transportation of these materials, the assembly and construction, the maintenance, repair and replacement, and finally, the deconstruction and disposal. Embodied carbon emissions will account for about 70% of a new building's total lifetime emissions. Whole life carbon is a combination of the building's embodied and operational carbon. Currently, Nationally, there are no requirements to measure, report or reduce emissions from construction. GLA and some local authorities are introducing requirements to measure, consider and benchmark embodied carbon emissions. But we need, to urge, we need urgently national policy to tackle these emissions. Substantial gaps and weaknesses remain in the government's set of policies for decarbonisation of manufacturing and construction. We, need to collectively, we needed to collectively map across the industry what was being done to tackle embodied carbon. 
the ACAN Embodied Carbon Group worked closely with the following groups to understand what had already been done, looking specifically at benchmarks, legislation, regulation, research, education, and toolkits. Our main aim of this campaign is that whole life carbon is required to be measured and lowered for all building and infrastructure projects. Through national building regulations, however, there are many scales and routes through which policy could be introduced, including building regulations, national planning policy, local planning policy, British standards, public procurement rules and tax rules. Only the building regulations can capture all projects, no matter their location, scale or ownership. The two documents which ACAM produced provided guidance and recommendation for policymakers, including the wider benefits of re regulating embodied carbon, which would be support the creation of green jobs in the UK manufacturing by stimulating demand for sustainable building projects, support the upcoming England Tree Strategy 35 by boosting the UK's timber industries, kickstart construction materials and recycling industry, catering for up to 290,000 jobs, incentivize the renewal of the British steel and construction industries, provide an incentive for the, relation, the retention of existing buildings over demolition, and providing businesses with a clear timeline as to how they need to adapt to net zero future. I'm going to play this short video. There is a massive blind spot in our national construction policy. Up to 80% of a new building's greenhouse gas emissions will be caused by its construction, maintenance, and demolition. These emissions, not within the industry, as embodied carbon, are unregulated. In the UK, embodied carbon accounts for more than 10% of our total national emissions. The construction industry has the skill and knowledge to tackle these emissions. What's missing is the political will and leadership. The ACAN is launching a campaign calling for whole life cycle carbon limits to be set within national planning policy and the building regulations. With a comprehensive report, policy briefing and wider political movement, ACAN will engage and awaken policymakers on this critical matter. Benefits of this type of policy are far-reaching supporting the creation of thousands of green jobs in the UK. The case to implement this policy is clear, but requires a systemic change to protect us all from devastating climate change and environmental degradation. ACAN's latest campaign demands that this change starts right now. So that was just a video that we made to accompany the, the Regulate Embodied campaign. Um, and again, going back to that collaborative effort and collective endorsement, we were endorsed by the following companies um, with whom we actually had a close working relationship as they reviewed the material that we produced. And also we reviewed material that groups such as Letty have produced in the past. Another campaign and project that is actually ongoing and that I'd like to talk to you about this evening is the Households Declare campaign. Um, which is run by ACAN. Um, in just over one year, ACAN has grown to several thousand members working in, nine, in the nine afford, aforementioned working groups. One of the biggest working groups is the existing buildings set up, who set up the Household Declare campaign, which has, has, which has had great success in establishing relationships across different industry and activist groups. In the UK, nearly all carbon equivalent emissions are a result of energy used in our homes. In fact, homes make up one of the single, the largest single sources of carbon emissions in the country. To be clear, the UK Committee of Climate Change stated, we will not meet our targets without near complete decarbonisation of the housing stock. ACAN recognised that to achieve this scale of decarbonisation, Collective action and collaboration will be essential to drive the scale of change. A recent report by the IPCC makes for, a sobering re makes for sobering reading and demonstrates the immensity of the challenge we 
we face unless we take urgent action together. Many households want to make retrofit improvements to their homes, but they lack the support or they don't know where to start. These are the problems we want to so solve. The UK has committed to net zero by 2050, with 80% of buildings that will exist in 2050 already built. To achieve the net zero target, urgent action needs to be taken from within our existing building stock. Declaring a climate emergency via this platform allows us to use our collective voice to send a strong message to government, whilst providing resources to help us learn together. One of our campaign's strongest me messages is about working together and bringing everyone along with us. The easiest way to share this message and get involved is by signing our petition and declaring a climate emergency ag against your property. Whether you are freeholder, leaseholder, renter or lodger, we want a collective voice to acknowledge that the housing stock we live in is not adequate in the face of the climate and ecological crises. ACAN joined forces with other industry groups, such as the Great Homes Upgrade, whose mission statements of eradicating damp from every home and powering our homes with clean energy align with two of ACAN's main aims of decarbonizing and cultural transformation. This photograph was taken from one of our recent um, group collaborations outside Parliament Square, um, something that we ran with um, the Great Homes Upgrade. And you can see at the front of the images, my ACAN colleague, Sarah Edmonds, who is one of the thematic group coordinators of existing buildings and also sits on the Architects uh, Climate Action Network UK steering group. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll now take any, any questions. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lauren, that was, um hugely impressive and, uh, and uplifting in the face of so many interrelated, interdependent, sober, sober realities. Um, there's so much from uh, what you've said that we can gain, gain some sort of respite from, um, in, you know, psychologically when we think about all these, the impacts of, um, of of the lack of proper policies and so on. I mean, I think um, one thing I'd say is that look, just looking at your, your organizational um, diagram, it's a beautifully synergized architectural design in its own right. Um, and uh, you've combined obviously very, very incisive research, very clear, very crystal clear organizational model with the, uh, the 11 person steering group and the eight working groups that have a degree, you know, the high degree of autonomy that you discussed, um, all united by polemical, very clear cut polemical strategies. Um, so tremendous impact already. And thinking back to 2017, 19, that, that heady period, because I think Letty was set up in 2017 and then hot on the heels of that, came ACAN and Architects Declare in the same, same year. Architects Declare's got a really big reach as well, hasn't it? With, um, I believe it's over, is it over, um, goodness me, I think it's over 28 different countries and over 7,000 signatories to its activities. Um, and then Reba's 2030 Climate Ch Challenge came along, didn't it? setting a series of targets for practices to adopt um, in the very same year that you and Architects Declare set up. And then we've got the UK building, Green Buildings Council, which is a fairly recent phenomenon, is that right? Yeah. So with, you've got, you've quite rightly, you know, in the forefront, there's the impact, the harrowing impact of the IPCC's recent report and then emissions clearly on the rise and not doing what we had hoped they would do. Um, activism, perpetual activism, tenacious, dogged activism is really critical. Um, so, I mean, there are a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. One, which is about uh, when you talk about the, the role of one of the autonomous working groups focusing on existing buildings. 
and your interest in cities as material banks. We could talk about the city of London as a, a material bank. But I think uh, one thing perhaps a lot of people might consider looking at it from the outside is in the, in the face of all these really, really galling facts, is it the case that architects have been relatively slow to move to a state of perpetual activism? Given, is it anything to do with the reality that 38% or so of global energy related greenhouse gas emissions are, are attributable to the built environment? Is it perhaps something to do with the phenomenon that, you know, when you're very close and you're in the thicket, of the deep, deep and dark forest, it's hard to see a way out. But it seems like the light, the light has come, and the um, the darkness has cleared. And there are so many, many, many brilliant groups now working together. And that, that is surely the case that um, architects have no excuse for a lack of clarity and to make learning, a, you know, learning every day about how they can um, forge their own policies with their, their individual practices. What do you think about those, some, those key issues? Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. there. No, thank you. <laughs> for, um, for us, it was, it was kind of this inertia that I mentioned at the start of my presentation that mm -hmm. um, we had, the, the science was immediately clear and has been for, for decades, you know, climate global heating has been known about since the 70s and oh. we I think we as built environment professionals have to take some responsibility for our contributions and I think it's recognizing that our professional decisions have much further reaching impacts than perhaps our, our personal decisions so mm. that could be about the materials that we specify the briefs that we're writing or the clients that we're taking on mm. so for for Architects Climate Action Network specifically, you know, um, the, the IPCC report of 2018 really raised the alarm for us. And I think it was born out of a frustration that not enough was being done quickly. So we have to acknowledge that we do need systemic change and there are different ways about how we can go about doing that. And ACAN was formed around those those types of change that I talked about, you know, like political campaigning, mm -hmm. knowledge sharing. And as you said, it's all about empowering the in individual. Um, we wanted to em empower the architectural worker um, to have the facts and the knowledge and the science at their fingertips uh, to potentially challenge um, their bosses, for example, or clients, etc., who who we work with and also I guess design teams and that's another element of collaboration that we haven't touched upon this evening is mm. acknowledging that architects are part of a design team and a design chain that include clients um, developers project managers engineers um, interior designers um, and you know it's about building up a bigger picture but also bringing everyone along with us and you know as you said Letty did some really groundbreaking work ahead of this architectural movement of, of ACAN and Architects Declare, who I, th I think Architects Declare and ACAN were born out of this, um, this kind of powerful climate action that was spawned from XR and um, also the, the youth climate action, the Fridays for Future movement. So you know, and, you know, there have been practices out there who have been doing sustainable and regenerative design for 30 years. And it's all, you know, that's, we need to be championing, championing those people who have already been doing it, they're leading the way. Um, but yes, it's this, it's kind of this, this lack of urgency that we've just been sort of business as usual for the last 30 years. And I think, um, as younger designers and, 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 and architects, architectural workers, engineers, you know, I think we felt empowered to, to demand change or enact change or be uh, a cause for change. And, you know, ACAN not only looks at the architectural industry, but also at other successful movements that have had success with their campaigns um, and, and looking at other demands. So. As I said, we have three overarching aims and they're very simple. You know, 
we've also done several multiple theories of change, which we do year on year, looking at how best to take the routes to achieve those aims and acknowledging that some of them, like the decarbonisation of the construction industry, are very um, target and scientific and they can be you know that's where we work closely with Letty and I think that's that has been shown in the projects that I've I've done or presented this evening from the Embodied Carbon Group but also looking at cultural transformation and I think that that's kind of the flip side of the coin that I've shown with the retrofit projects and the demanding of the great homes upgrade so it, you know it's it's all about empowering the individual and I think ACAN what Agan has done successfully over the last 12 months is that we've brought that outside of the architectural realm as well. And we've put it on homeowners and people who live in homes because, you know, we're now experiencing this huge cost of living crisis. And actually, we do need to properly insulate our buildings. And um, yes, I, I've digressed a bit, haven't I? Maybe you can <laughs> steer me back. <laughs> Well, right uh, early on at the outset, you referred in passing to your particular role at ACAN being related to movement culture. And I was going to ask you about that because I wasn't immediately sure quite what was meant by that, but now I actually am um, crystal clear on the, on the implication of that. So um, uh, going to the other side of my question, which is honing in on the um, the eight, the, the one of the eight working groups that focuses on existing buildings, um, and you talked about cities as material banks. Um, what what do you know of how the city of London itself is approaching this whole issue of um, reducing embodied carbon? Because we we know, as you quite rightly stated, eighty percent of all the buildings that will exist in two thousand and fifty have already that have already been built, you know, and therefore the implications are that, um, you know, we're standing knee deep in buildings which have been built based on certain assumptions about um, efficiency and desirability and uh, sweetness and light, but have they also been built on the basis of the right kind of reduction of embodied carbon assumptions, uh, a carbon, I, I assume uh, in many cases not. So that part of the city that we know and love, which is just so incredibly steeped in rich history and heritage and moving forward at pace as it always likes to do and recovering now you know, from the pandemic at, at, at pace. How do you see the work that they're doing? Because they have been doing an awful lot of work on um, uh, nature positive, on environment positive measures related to biodiversity, that's for sure. Um, perhaps you know more about the the other activities and the policy measures they've adopted. Uh, yeah, I I think we, as you say, there's kind of this key term here, isn't there? Like materials as sit, uh, sorry, cities as material banks. You know, yeah. there's a huge amount of embodied energy that is already in the material that exists in our cities. So, mm. how do we, as built environment professionalists, and this goes for me, this goes way beyond the role of the architect. This is engineers. This is mm. policymakers. This is people such as yourself and I who work at at local government level. And I think. Um, what we've realized and what we've seen perhaps from our public practice cohort is that we have officers who are specializing in retrofit specifically looking at the the kind of the it, it ranges right doesn't it from the historic the historic buildings that we have that are grade one and two listed but it also goes down to the the social housing stock that we have and issues of of social cleansing so you know we have to be really careful about what buildings what buildings mean to us and why we you know why we've decided to invest in the, the building stock that we already have so for example retrofitting a, a historic fabric would be far far more difficult and and it has its own challenges than perhaps retrofitting a 1960s housing stock that's that's brick cavity so you know we understand that that we need to up up our game as built environment professionalists and we need to massively invest in expertise and technology and looking at how to retrofit those buildings correctly because if we retrofit those buildings incorrectly it can actually make the problem of 
of damp and ventilation and moisture worse in some cases, um, specifically looking at different types of insulation and obviously upgrading our, our window stock, for example. Um, so yeah, it. I would say that central government and local government both have huge parts to play in, in this. And I think I mentioned in my presentation that actually to do it more holistically, uh, we need uh, we need to have central government lead the way. But I think that local government ha could play a huge role in this by setting more ambitious targets, and that's something that I I feel more empowered by now working in the public sector and being able to recognise um, our role in in kind of building stock and also the, the teams that are working. To do, to do that basically. Um, obviously most local authorities in the city of London have individual climate action plans. And, you know, I think it's 20, 26 or 27 out of the, the, London, the 31 London boroughs have declared a climate emergency. Um, and I would challenge those last remaining few who haven't to do so. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, also the range of targets of each of each of the local governments or local authorities really ranges, whether they've set ambitious targets from 2025, for example, or 2030 or 2040 or even 2050. You know, we we have a, a national target of being net zero by 2050, but actually a lot of local authorities are going further to, to do that. And as I said, retrofitting our existing building stock will, will play a huge part in that because it already exists. Um, so yeah, yeah, and uh, the the steps forward that the vast majority of London uh, local authorities have taken has been hugely in, inspiring, and uh, coupled with the growing phenomenon of citizen assemblies as well, um, in, and uh, you know dovetailing the two two initiatives, climate emergency declaration plus citizen assemblies, is really quite quite powerful. I mean, to just go back to local government, um, you want to always, you know, we regularly check in to see what the latest is there. And I just wondered out of interest, what, what's happened to the 10 minute rule decarbonizing bill, asking for the whole life of carbon emissions of buildings to be reported, which apparently popped up in February. Has that, is that still alive? Or do you know the latest with that? I don't know the latest. You don't, no. No. And uh, what priorities um, are, are, are they are in force now with the national retrofit strategy uh, that's come into existence for homes? Has that got real teeth to it? Um, I think I think it, it has the potential to go quite far. As okay. with most things, this comes yeah. down to cost a lot of the time. And actually, retrofit is hugely expensive for the homeowner um, yeah. or the landlord, for example. Um, so I would say that the, the support and the money that's available could, could go further, certainly. Um, and also, as I said earlier, it's about um, upskilling the people who are, who are doing the actual work to the homes as well, absolutely. Because yeah. if we're looking at new technologies or we've got, um, specifications of certain types of materials you know they those need to be properly installed mm -hmm. and and sealed correctly if we're going to mm -hmm. stop our drafty homes mm -hmm. so it's I think again as with most things it comes back to that word of collectively or collaboratively um bringing everyone with us together to do multiple strands of 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 kind of these missions or these projects or this policy that we're implementing so um and they will have a cost attached to them and they will have expertise gaps attack, attached to them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, you know, we obviously we've seen the rise of other environmental groups such as Insulate Britain, a very simple, clear campaign message that's been about insulating our homes in Britain. Um, in the past week, we've had this incredibly dangerous and frightening, to be perfectly honest, terrifying heat wave in the UK. And we're now talking about how our housing stock and our housing infrastructure is, is has the, the opposite effect of what we've been talking about with regards to insulation. But, you know, 
Britain's housing stock is is overheating and that's major cause for concern as well so we need to have strategies about adaptation and mitigation for the climate emergency that that do two sides of the coin right so yeah it it you know these things are being these things are being spoken about and that's that's great but they need to be accelerated basically and we need to have more support and we need to have more industry action to make sure that it's happening faster and, and correctly yeah and also you get a perfect storm when you have the phenomena of which are phenomena such as permitted development housing which is housing created out of former office spaces or spaces within buildings that were originally designated for a completely different use, not suitable for housing in, in the first place, and a heat wave, and then they are overheating in their own ways, creating all sorts of environmental issues too. So um, you, you're, you've risen at wholly the right time. And uh, I must say also, I really enjoy your the webinars that you you present as part of your very strong educational strategy. So, for example, under the heading of your other the other theme of one of your other working groups, um, which is all about um, natural materials. So you can go on your, the ACAN website and um, find some highly informative events, which apparently so, for example, busting myths about passive house working with natural materials and then how to you know build for example with hemp which is apparently very fast growing carbon sequestering material a lot, not a lot of people realize that and with earth and with um, straw timber lime and natural fibers so so tell me lauren what have you personally learned the most um, of value in your own architectural and urban design work from all the work, all the investigative work that you've done with ACAN? That is a really good question. And no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> I, I um, as I said in my CV, and you said at the beginning of the talk, I was living in Copenhagen. And when I came back to London, I began work as an architect at, at both May, which you mentioned, and also mm. Studio Bark. Um, and I was lucky enough to work on projects at both practices that were incredibly low carbon, that focused on circular economy. Mm. And I think whilst I was doing those projects, it was informing my work with ACAN and driving me forward to, to you know, like a ACAN was a fledgling organization back in 2019. I could count the number of coordinators on, on two hands, you know, mm. it was a really small, group of us that 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 started it and you know by I at the start of of the organization it was much easier to keep to keep fingers in many pies and be parts of lots of different thematic groups and working groups and have much better contact as to what was going on so you know it wasn't unusual for one of us to be involved in secular economy and embodied carbon and I think taking that really hands-on approach to, to learning, we knew that we were young architectural assistants or architects and that we would have to skill up in the process of helping others skill up. And I think that's what I talk about when I mentioned movement building. It was, mm -hmm. we've all been on our own personal journeys of like acceptance and grief and mm -hmm. horror and then basically collective action, I think. So by, looking at you know by by skilling up ourselves it was really rewarding to then use it in my day-to-day -day practice and as I said I worked on a project which was made out of um CLT with circular economy principles so when parts of that building become weathered or damaged or need replacing elements can can be switched in and out and then mm -hmm. when I worked at Studio Bark we were very hands-on in our in our embodied, embodied carbon approach, you know, like we did the spreadsheets, we calculated the embodied carbon of all of our different wall types across the, ho the whole studio. And mm -hmm. we ran upskilling sessions with the whole studio on a Friday afternoon that specifically looked at our carbon skills as a practice. So it, 
that's how I've implemented or how I've worked with other ACAN colleagues and, and colleagues at work to, mm. to upskill basically. Mm. Um, and obviously selecting low carbon materials such as timber, which is easily replenished or hemp as well, which is much less talked about, unfortunately. Mm. What the Natural Buildings Material Group has done as, as you've, you've said is like spread the word about these lesser known materials that could be and are very much viable options for re replacing insulation and replacing structure. Um, so I think we need to keep putting the word out there so people like me can be can go back to their practice or whether that, I don't know, whether that's private sector or public sector work um, mm. and say, we need to be looking at these different types of, of materials and, and more sustainable regenerative practices. Mm -hmm. So um, in which country in the world or which city in the world would you say is, uh, is uh, the full scale, full sector adoption of circular economy with regard to building construction in the most advanced? Oh, that, I mean, there are lots Scandinavia? of... Scandinavia? Probably Scandinavia would be up in the top five for sure. Um, we've definitely had a, a lot of contact with Scandinavian companies um, practices uh, mm. such as Lenawa, who are Danish and they came to our circular economy series. Mm. Um, there are also lots of companies in um, the Netherlands who are doing great things with material no. um, uh, resources and, and, and basically salvaging materials from, mm. from existing buildings or buildings that are going to be demolished. So we're, I mean, there's, there's definitely room for improvement in the UK, you know, other countries mm. are, are leading the way and that was something that we looked at with the circular economy group at, at ACAN of, you know, trying mm -hmm. to introduce this, this eighth stage or engaging the RIBA in conversations around, uh, uh, you know, the plan of work has um, seven stages currently, mm -hmm. but um, looking at how you, we could introduce uh, another stage in construction to basically close the loop, uh, a, a stage that looks at the deconstruction of buildings so yeah we we absolutely could be doing more and by upskilling and teaching ourselves about deconstruction techniques it will ultimately inform how we construct those buildings because if we know that something is easier to put together with bolts um rather than adhesive glues which ruin both the both materials of, of which it's it's formed to you know um i mean you know, there's a scale of what's better. You've got glues and adhesives and then staples and nails and then bolts, for example, this is very rudimental, but bolts being the best because you can simply unbolt materials. So yeah, looking at deconstruction techniques to inform construction techniques, I think that would be a really healthy way of looking at circular economy as a design. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to looking and maybe even measuring the building stock in the city of London, for example, has anyone ever mapped exactly what material is, is here? You know, it would be a huge, huge endeavor, but some of my ACAN colleagues have been ambitious to start talking about it. You know, actually, if we had apps or digital technology that knew exactly what was in what building, would we be able to then, you know, use, have building catalogs basically, but there's mm -hmm. all of this, um, there's a there's a lot of baggage that comes with buildings basically because you've got insurances and warranties and a lot of people mm -hmm. won't touch mm -hmm. that stuff because it's it's far cheaper and far more convenient to build from from scratch sure um i'm sure some of our state-of-the-art living heritage surveyors are on the case with regard to the the, the de deployment of those types of digital technologies um However, obviously, I think we're very, all very aware that they need the proper kind of mandate from the client. So it's actually something the client's got to feel, believe in wholeheartedly is, is the, at the heart of their mission. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think your circular economy um, polemic is absolutely so well founded. And so I would ask the question whether it in fact is on the um, campaigning agenda of all three of the um, candidates for president of Reba <laughs> at the moment and if by any chance it's uh, not on the one that finally wins the others are going to be working with that candidate quite closely but I think it's it's something that should really be out there in the public 
in the public realm as a disc in as a much bigger discussion. But obviously, at the same time, it would hugely help if the Mayor of London, the London Assembly, could hold that up as the next stage in implementing on the ground uh, full blown circular economy within the construction industry. How far away do you, do you and your colleagues at ACAN feel that that closing of the gap is, is with regard to the mayor and, uh, and uh, construction industry clients? Uh, the mayor of London has written some good groundwork for a circular mm -hmm. economy. Like for example, there is a circular economy statement that is available um, yeah. as a free resource. I think obviously, we we could be and we definitely should be going further with that so mm -hmm. you know you can write a piece of policy documentation but actually i'd be really interested in discussing how that piece of policy is then put in transferred into action so i think this there's not only kind of this uh, expertise gap but there's also this action gap where we've we've got a lot of experts who have who have written these reports for example the ipcc Mm -hmm. What is one of these documents? You know, we've we have the state of the nation and we have policy and regulation and guidance, but actually looking at how we implement that into action and change and how that's actually what that is formalized in as an as an architecture. And I think mm. he is particularly good at championing um different exemplar projects that are doing these things, you know, Letty have this amazing initiative called the Letty Pioneers. And, you know, it's about showcasing people who are already doing this work. Um, and that's that's really great. But how do we get the average architectural firm who arguably is practicing degeneratively, you know, we are, we're an industry who consumes at an alarming rate and it's why we're responsible for such a huge greenhouse gas emission total, should we say. Um, and how we get those kind of practices to start moving towards exemplar projects. And I would actually be really keen, as you've mentioned, the institutions for, for groups such as the RIBA and the ARB to start more stringently putting environmental targets and protections, not only on regulations, but also competitions, for example, or even prizes. You know, there's a lot of talk recently, you know, we've got the Sterling shortlist why isn't there more why aren't there more stringent environmental design designs on these really high awarding architectural projects i think that would be key and we can lead by example and those projects that don't adhere are could be penalized for example or just not or they're just not in the running for example so i think yeah that's really topical with everything that's going on at the moment yeah, I think um, I think you're right on track with that, and it simultaneously dovetailed with the reality that um, quite a few local authorities have changed the game when it comes to their procurement standards, um, the ethos of their procurement. So if they lay down, they make the argument. You know, if they're laid, laying down a new ethos uh, underlying their procurement of new buildings and urban designs, then you know, in order for architects to, to be in the game, they and win out, win, have a chance to win commissions, they need to make sure that they're adhering to these standards in the first place. Otherwise, they're going to be uh, left out of public sector work. That is definitely the case. So, um, so I think have we made our message, your message to to the mayor of London, sufficiently clear? Is there any particular question that you would like? him to uh, focus on if we sent him a copy of this video <laughs> that's uh, my final question by the way <laughs> <laughs> will you be sending him a copy that's an interesting thought well we, we we do regularly we like to write to him and bring things to his attention because we are a, we are a charity that believes in quality and uh, uh, quality and standards and have a strong ethos in our own right yeah absolutely I think um, what the Mayor of London has done quite successfully in the past has chosen excellent design advocates. Um, for example, you know, one of the co-founders of Letty is, is one of his design advocates and mm. previous employers have been their de design advocates. So, you know, he's clearly consulting in the, in the right circles, but, you know, perhaps it's not with the, the urgency that, that is required. And, you know, 
ultimately London is a is a capital city um, mm. and and a lot of other countries and capital cities look towards London to set excellent examples so yeah I mean by all means please share this and tell him to get in touch um yeah. Acan would love to accelerate in realms that we haven't before so that yeah that sounds brilliant <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that, Lauren. That was really, really amazing. I love to dissect and uh, and and take a closer look at uh, relatively new organisations and institutions, like because you are an institution of a very unique kind, a new a new one that's been born on on the on this huge wave of outrage, all the waves of outrage that you know we, we've um, been experiencing and have ourselves and um, I can just see Akan going from strength to strength because you are truly rigorous in the in the way that you apply your polemicism but you're also the de demo democratization of the organization um, juggling all the different groups and the different members and their in respective interests and levels of knowledge and so on it's quite Quite awesome, really. It's almost like setting up Reba, Reba for the 21st century <laughs> all over again. Anyway, um, thank you very much. It was very lucid. And I'm going to um, finish off now by just a couple of highlights of what people can look forward to um, in the autumn on in terms of our programme. So um, quickly to flag that up. So as I think I mentioned earlier, I think we're kicking off our autumn program of actual in-person events on Monday the 19th of September. So that's going to be at Temple Bar on Paternoster Square. And it's going to be the first of what will be a regular Monday evening series of slots there. Um, and it's going to be at, uh, a talk focusing on the work of Big London. So two of uh, Big London's partners, Lorenzo Body and Andrew, and Andrew Young, uh, Big London standing for Bianca Engels Group, uh, their London office, talking about their work across the city, including in the city of London and at King's Cross with Google. Um, and like all of our events, events from September, it's going to be live streamed as well as an option for those choosing to watch remotely. And further details on how to sign up are going to be online in the next week. So please check back the website. And um, I promise you, we're going to be asking Lorenzo and Andy some leading questions with regard to sustainability and regenerative practices. Um, they're not going to be let off that lightly. <laughs> and um, hopefully we, we're even more um, geed up by the the fact that we've spoken with ACAN now as well, because th this is not a topic to be in any shape or form complacent about. So equally exciting later in the autumn on a date to be confirmed in early September, hopefully a bit nearer to November or December, we're going to have a talk by Dr. Neil Chassor, Head of School and Chief Executive Officer at the London School of Architecture. Now he's an architectural historian by training and he's passionate about diversifying architectural education, heritage and practice. So we really look forward to seeing you uh, all in person and or, and or online from September. And in the meantime, if you'd like to watch any of our online talks that we have um, videotaped over the last two years, they're all on YouTube. And all you need to do is just check out our education pro page on our website and uh, scroll down and you'll find them all there and go straight onto the YouTube page that we have. So um, thanks again, Lauren, and um, have a fantastic rest of the summer, everyone. Thank you so much for, for watching this video and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.